Hi, my name is Jane Trotter. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters Northwoods chapter. And I'd like to welcome everyone to our March 9th public presentation. It's an open meeting. And um, before we go any further, I want to let people know that this meeting is being recorded. So um, it will be available for viewing later on our YouTube channel. Um, I am, um, the next thing I think I need to do here is to do our, what we've now, our diversity welcome to country. So um, the Northwood League of Women Voters remembers that we are practicing democracy on the traditional lands of the Ojibwe, the Dakota, the Menominee and the Ho-Chunk and Potawatomi nations. And we thank them. So um, we will in a minute, Kay Hoff will be introducing our speaker who is Tom Kamenek. Um, we will be open for questions during this time, uh, but please enter them in chat. And one of our, um, Karen, Kit Karen Kitsy will sort of monitor them and uh, uh, she'll be the one that presents them to Tom. Um, the last thing I need to remind people is that the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization. We are dedicated to voter participation and education. And, um, Therefore, we do not endorse any particular uh, political platform or party or uh, candidate. And so when you ask questions, um, please keep that in mind. And um, this is questions or welcome statements are kind of like, you know, maybe for a discussion at the end if we have time. But again, please hold in mind our nonpartisan policy. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to um, Kay Hoff, who is um, part of the um, Citizens for Education in, uh, in a government group. And she will explain a little bit about what that is and then introduce Tom. So thank you. All right. So as Jane said, I, I'm a member of both of the sponsoring organizations today, which is an event called Part of Sunshine Week, which is a, a yearly event every um, mid-March. Uh, it's where hundreds of groups and organizations show the public the importance of open government, or as the League says, government functions best when it operates in the open. So to operate in the open, the government bodies are expected to hold what Tom will tell us are open meetings and provide reasonable access to public records. I was a little shocked to learn that there's still a handful of states that exempt themselves by legislative immunity. So maybe Tom will tell us about that. Uh, <clears throat> so in just a few minutes, Tom is going to tell us just what those words open meetings and reasonable access to public records actually mean to you and to me. Uh, just a few words about Citizens for Education in Town Governance. We were established in Flambeau five years ago. We're a nonpartisan, non-government organization. Uh, we are dedicated to learning about town governance and then sharing that information with others. And we do that by attending every town meeting and recording it. And then our president, Norm Wetzel, put, Wetzel puts everything on our website that I hope many of you will check out at Weebly CETG. And so now to the, our impressive guest, Tom Kamernick. Uh, Tom is the president and founder of the Wisconsin Transparency Project. That is a law firm dedicated to the strict enforcement of the state's open records and open meetings laws. Now, prior to forming that, Tom was deputy counsel and litigation manager at the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty. We are all familiar, I hope, with that respected law firm and think tank, Will, where Tom led the litigation team to federal and state court successes as four wins on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Tom has also been a law clerk for a former Wisconsin Supreme Court justice and a research assistant to the Dean of the Marquette Law School. 
So it's not surprising that Tom graduated magna cum laude from, Margaret Law School, from Marquette Law School. And prior to that, with high honors, a fine arts degree in music education from UW-Milwaukee. Now, on top of all that, Tom, you still manage to be a regular family guy living in Port Washington with your wife, two children, and an Irish wolfhound. Uh, I hear you're also a community asset where you enjoy singing with your church choir and performing in the local community theater groups. So please join me with a very big and warm welcome to our impressive guest, Tom. Thank you so much, Kay, and thank you to the Citizens for Education and Town Governance and League of Wisconsin, uh, League of Women Voters, Northwoods, uh, for bringing me on today. And I, I do have a wolfhound, and she is gorgeous. If we have time at the end, I'll see if I can bring her into my office. I'm going to try to share my screen here and get this presentation going. And ideally, right now, you've got a view where you can see both me and uh, my screen, which is showing the a PowerPoint presentation I've got. So we're going to be talking, as Kay said, about both open records and open meetings laws. And I want to go back and take a step back to talk about a little, what's the history, what's the purpose of these laws? Why do we think they're important to start with? One of the most common answers I get when I ask this question is, this is all about public money. This is Government is funded with taxpayer money. This is our money. We deserve to know what's going on with it, what it's being used for. Elections, you'll see a lot of talk about getting access to information about our elected officials. It's very hard for to have an informed electorate to make good decisions in when, when we are voting if you can't find out what our elected officials are doing. How do you know if they're doing a good job and deserve to be retained or not? But openness goes beyond just elected officials to more generic accountability for all levels of government. As the Constitution says, this is we the people uh, that are forming our governments. We, we the people are the sovereign entities that are in control of our, our governments and we need access to its operations in order to perform those functions. Another important use of these records and this information is developing policy, doing research. So we're obviously in the middle of one of the worst pan pandemics we've suffered as a country with COVID and different states and different areas are trying out different responses. And one of the big questions is what's working? And, and people are trying to answer that now. People will be trying to answer that for years and decades to come, I'm sure, to prepare for the next big one. And it's hard to get good information and just figure out what worked and what didn't if you can't get information from the people who have been managing uh, our responses to the crisis. Finally, there's kind of a posterity, a future, a backwards looking purpose for all of this and that we take a look at, at our history through records. You know, we have the collected papers of George Washington in our archives. We have the letters of Alexander Hamilton well, now we've got the emails of Governor Tony Evers and the tweets of former President Trump to, to, to serve as uh, records for posterity as well. I'm gonna take a real quick sec to make sure I have my chat open so I do see anything there. I forgot to do that when I started. Our country was founded on the Declaration of Independence. And if you remember your history and your document, you know that a good chunk of it is devoted to a listing of grievances of everything that we didn't like uh, that the Crown was doing. And people are surprised to learn that there is stuff in there about open government. There is an entry, you can read it down there, I won't quote it to you, but you can see it talks about both meetings and records. They complained about those practices. And it was important to our founders that government be accessible to the people. Wisconsin has a long history of openness too. One of our very earliest Supreme Court decisions ruled that counties had to fund their clerk's offices and supply them with wood and candles so that people could go in and read the uh, read the records that were held in those offices. They couldn't neglect that, that duty. Now, our tradition of openness goes all the way back to English common law, uh, but back in English courts, the right of access to records only applied to records about yourself. So if government had records about me, I could go look at those. 
Wisconsin took that a step further though in the early 20th century and said, no, actually any person has the right to view any public record for any lawful purpose. So it, it took that initial right that we had and expanded it further. In 1917, the state legislature created the first comprehensive open records law. Prior to that time, there were individual statutes saying this set of records would be held open and that set of records could be accessed. But in 1917, they kind of brought it all in and said all records can be accessed. And in 1981 was the creation of, of what we now know as our current open records law. So let's talk about that open records law then in, in Wisconsin. The preamble is here. This is the very first words of the open records law. It's found at section 1931 in the statutes. Again, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but you can take a look over this and see the kind of powerful language that's used here. The Wisconsin Supreme Court has said that this is the most powerful statement of policy to be found anywhere in the statutes. And it talks about some of the things we just mentioned, like representative government and an informed electorate. It tells, uh, it tells us that the public policy of the state is that all persons are entitled to the greatest, most expansive access to information about government that's possible. Another important thing in here is that it says that fulfilling record requests, making access, giving access to people is a fundamental part of government and it's a routine duty. It's not a special thing that's created that should be done begrudgingly. It's supposed to be a basic, foundational part of what government does. So the basic principle of the open records law is stated really simply, and it's actually quoted almost exactly like this in the statutes, that the idea is that all records of state and local authorities must be made available to the public for inspection and copying. Anytime we have statutes like this, raises questions here about what's an authority then, who does the law apply to, and what's a record? What can you actually get? So we'll start with the definition of an authority because the question is whose records can you get? And this is quoted from the statutory language. And it starts out with this really, really broad uh, l list and categorization of government entities. A couple important things here. One is it's state or local. This does not apply to federal governments. Uh, that is managed by the Federal Freedom of Information Act or FOIA. But then it has a list of basically any kind of government entity you could think of, individual officials, agencies, boards, commissions, committees, departments, anything else that's a public body corporate. So that means it's a government entity of some kind that's created by constitution, law, ordinance, rule, or order. That's a really comprehensive list of anything that's governmental uh, in the state of Wisconsin. It goes on to add this idea of a quasi-governmental corporation. Now I could teach an entire class on trying to figure out exactly what that is, but it gets at this idea that the government can't kind of shunt off its responsibilities to a third party and then say, well, that's a private organization. It's not subject to the law. There's a limit to how much they can do that. The most prototypical example I usually think of is like an economic development corporation. Those kind of public private partnerships are very often subject to the records law. The statute goes on to kind of cover a few more things, but the idea here is that there is a broad, broad group of government entities that are subject to this law. They're trying to capture everything that you can think of. So we move on to the question of what is a record? That often is, is a big, uh, issue of dispute when you get into court or when you're arguing with a custodian. Here's the statutory definition that they put in there. And again, if you read through it, it's incredibly broad. They're literally saying if government has something in its possession that has information on it, it's a record. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what kind of information it is. I want to draw this distinction because a lot of times I get custodians arguing oh, these, this, the, uh, this document doesn't have information about the government, it has information about something else and therefore it's not a record. You read through this, there's nothing in here that says the information has to be about the functions of government. Some states do that. In fact, a lot of states uh, define record that way, but Wisconsin does not. Wisconsin says if it's in the hands of government and it has information on it, it's a record. 
And as the bottom part of the definition shows there, um, gives some examples, but it's not an, uh, an exclusive all encompassing list of what those records might look like. And again, it's pretty much anything you could think of. And even back in 1981, they were thinking about electronic records so that kind of information is included. Now the statute does say that some things are not records, even if they uh, meet that earlier definition. The big one we see from a lot of uh, a lot of custodians when they're arguing with us is this first exemption for drafts, notes, preliminary computations. The key here is that just because something is a draft doesn't exclude it from the law. It has to meet one of these, uh, these two other conditions. It has to be either prepared by the person who's going to use it. So the mayor writes a draft speech, three or four different draft speeches, and then at the end of the day, only the final version is going to be a, a record that's subject to the law. The second part of that is what if somebody's working for somebody else and preparing it for somebody else? So that means, for example, if the, uh, if the mayor's secretary writes a few drafts for the, the, the mayor, those will be protected too. But just because something is not final does not mean it is not a record. So if you get a draft audit, for example, prepared by an out of government, an out of government private organization for the government, and they send a, pri a, a draft audit to the, the city, for example, that draft is going to be a record. It won't be covered by this draft exemption because the audit company wasn't preparing it for their use. They shared it with something, somebody else. So typically once a document goes from one department or one government entity to another one, it loses that draft protection. Tom, can I interrupt here? We have a, a question right in the chat. It's actually a question I wanted to ask too. What about personnel records or medical records? For example, Wisconsin Department of Health records and emails and health cases. And just as, I don't know if this is what this person was thinking, but we have a local newspaper that's been trying to get the emails of our, uh, Oneida County Health Department official. Is, does that count as a record? So that would meet the definition of record, but it's gonna be subject to an exemption, which we can get to later. Okay. Uh, so it's kind of a, a several step process. The first step is, is this thing a record? Then the second question is, is there a specific exception that says you can't get that record? And then there's even a third step that, that talks about the balancing test. And we'll get right to that. Um, okay. It's actually coming up in one of the next few slides. Thank you. But right now we're, we're finishing up on what the mm. statute says is not a record. Second big category is purely personal property of the custodian notice. So if you're talking about um, you know, your teachers or your frontline office workers in, in city hall, they're not a custodian. But what this does mean is that if your mayor has a picture of his family on his desk, even though that's in the possession of the government, it has information on it, photographs can often be records, that won't qualify as a record because it's purely personal for the custodian. There's a few other small exception, exceptions written to the statute. They're down there, you can take a look at them. They don't come up a whole lot very often though. We talked about the two big ones, the drafts and the purely personal exceptions. So once you move beyond the open records law itself, you also have to look at other statutes. So that somewhere in the open records law, it says that the law does not apply if another statute provides an exception. So those are scattered all across the ordinances and statute books, but big ones that come up often would be FERPA. So educational records of pupils are typically exempted. HIPAA, <laughs> getting to what we were talking about with uh, with emails or that contain medical information about individuals. Sensitive information, for example, uh, you know, the information about the governor's security detail or the, the layouts, the blueprints of government buildings are exempted. Kind of an obvious one, confidential informants. That might be one of the first exceptions people think of off the top of their head of what probably can't you get? Yeah, the criminal defendant can't find out the name of the person who, who ratted him out in more cases than not. Courts have also created different exceptions uh, to the records law that apply to large categories. 
of records. One of them is prosecutor files. So that was an early case from Wisconsin. So the district attorney's files on a criminal case by and large are not subject to the open records law. Personal emails is another one. So if you, uh, this case was from 2010, it's when actually I was uh, clerking on the Wisconsin Supreme Court, the Shill case, it was Wisconsin Rapids. And the, what the court ruled there was that if teachers in this, in this case were using their school email addresses on school computers and they were sending occasional uh, personal notes on them, uh, you know, emails to their spouses to pick up kids, uh, things about dentist appointments, kind of typical stuff you'd expect anybody in a, in a workplace might use their, their work accounts for on occasion. Uh, and the court ruled that those are generally not going to be, uh, don't have to be turned over unless they evidence some violation of law or policy of the employer. Finally, the last big court created category is uh, attorney client privileged information. So when the government is working with its attorneys to develop, a le to get legal advice or to develop litigation strategies, those will often be exempted. So for example, uh, it's been in the news recently that uh, school district, I, I don't recall which one off the top of my head, but they were investigating um, internal misbehavior and they chose to hire an attorney to do the investigation. And the result, unfortunately, was that pretty much everything that, that was done as part of that investigation now becomes attorney-client privilege. So it was a very, very expensive way for the district to be able to keep a lot of that information from the public. Tom, can I interrupt with another question? Go ahead. Uh, uh, this is from Megan. Um, can an elected official who is a commissioner for a lake district, for example, and they are also a member of a Lake Property Owners Association, if they send or receive emails with other property owners discussing lake issues, could they be exempt if they claim they are working in the capacity of a private citizen or on a private board and not in the capacity of an elected official, even if there is crossover in the role? That's a really tight question right there. Uh, it, you, you start with a, a pretty basic idea that you can't avoid the open records law by using your private email accounts, your private computers. So as a general rule, when elected officials or even government employees do government work on their private accounts and uh, uh, equipment, those are still subject to the open records law. That's the technical law. Now you get difficulties where uh, the people in charge of collecting and doing the searching are those very officials and, and the information is not being stored centrally where IT, um, where, where your IT department can go through and get it. You're relying on the boxes who are guarding the hen houses to say, yep, yep, I turned over everything. So you often get a, a lot of questions of distrust there. Um, and then as Megan brings up, you have this issue of well, when are they acting in their official capacity and when are they acting as private citizens? I think the court would be very likely to read the records law broadly to meet these goals of, uh, of transparency and say, if, if it's related at all, they don't get to hide behind their private persona. If it's related to what their government function is, it should be disclosed, that they should be erring on the side of disclosure and not on the side of secrecy. We've talked about statutes that create exceptions, and we talked about courts that have created uh, blanket exceptions like you know, emails and prosecutor's files, but there's still one big category of exceptions left, and this is the balance and test. You'll often read these from uh, custodians when you get a denial letter. Uh, a lot of denials will be based on the balancing test is what they call it. And how this is supposed to work is the custodian or a court who's reviewing a case is supposed to take any public interests in non-disclosure, in secrecy, and weigh those against the public dis interests in disclosure, in transparency, and see which one weighs more heavily. I hope you noticed the key thing there that I said that it's the public interest in non-disclosure. So theoretically, they're not supposed to be considering private interests like 
I'm an employee. I don't want my uh, I don't want my personnel file released because it's embarrassing. They're not supposed to consider that. Uh, there is a kind of bleed over area though, because they'll often say, okay, it's not that employee's particular interest in secrecy, but rather the public's interest in not embarrassing these people for reasons of we want to not turn away, we don't want to scare off potential employees, uh, we want to allow public employees to still have some modicum of privacy in their lives. Do you get those built in too? I, I have some of the categories of public interest that courts may consider here. The list goes on and on and unfortunately kind of always expands, but some of the big ones are, is there a safety issue? Is somebody going to be put at danger by releasing these records? A personal privacy of individual citizens is often considered particularly if those people are victims. Uh, they have both constitutional and statutory rights of privacy that sometimes get considered. I talked a little bit about the idea of, of morale or hiring interests, about the ability to hire qualified candidates and to not lose uh, valuable employees. That kind of comes in sometimes. And also bargaining or competitive reasons. So your prototypical example here is there's a, a bargaining document that lays out, uh, you know, the city is willing to pay up to $2 million for this parcel of land. They hope to buy it for a million dollars. Well, if the parcel owner knows that they'll go up to $2 million, that will hurt their bargaining, uh, the bargaining position of the city, which kind of in turn hurts the public purse, uh, so those can often be considered. Now, on the other side of the scale, it's really important to realize, and custodians often forget this or intentionally ignore it, but the default is disclosure. There is no such thing as a government record that the public has no interest in seeing. The courts have said time and time again that the default is disclosure, and there's a strong public interest at the very start of the case that scale is already tipped way in favor of disclosure, and it should take a lot of stuff on the other side of the scale to overcome it. There are some things that, uh, that kind of increase that default interest is leadership involved. You know, the higher the level of the official or the employer involved, the more important it is for the public to know about it. Are these elected officials uh, whose records are at issue? Again, that's a, a greater interest in disclosure because these people are directly responsible to the public. The public has to make decisions about retaining them through elections. Is there misconduct involved? The public has greater interest in learning about any kind of misconduct, even if it's at a very low level of employee. Is money being spent? Are there other accountability issues at play? Those are the kind of things we are looking for uh, in potential reasons that disclosure is called for. I'm gonna move on for a sec to talk about the money side of things. Say that they've decided that they do have records that are responsive to your requests and that there are, uh, there are no exceptions, so they're gonna turn over the records. Well, sometimes they can charge you before you get, to, you get to see them. There are three main categories of fees they're allowed to, allowed to charge. Uh, I'm not gonna get into photographic processing fees of those, those have largely gone out the window with technological advancements, but there are allowed, allowed to charge for copies or transcriptions of records for locating the records and for mailing the records. What they cannot charge you for is time spent redacting the records. This was an issue at the Wisconsin Supreme Court about five years ago. Custodians were arguing that, hey, it takes a long time to go through these records and black out things or delete things that shouldn't be shared. We should get to be compensated for that. Wisconsin Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that because you can only charge the fees that the statute says you can charge and that list on the left is what those fees are and redaction doesn't fit into those. Now, open records litigation is often a game of whack-a-mole and as soon as you say you can't do this, you can't do that, custodians often try to find a way around it. So what I've seen pop up now is uh, they'll, they'll claim that they're reviewing the records and that's somehow part of the location of, of, of your responsive records. Courts haven't ruled on this yet. I don't think it's appropriate. 
Uh, it's something I've written several letters on and I've gotten custodians to back down away from on multiple occasions. Uh, as well as review, sometimes I see it categorized or described as locating the actual responsive record. So what they'll say is, well, we ran some keyword searches and it, uh, it generated 2000 responsive records. Now we need to go through those one at a time and see if they're really responsive to what you're looking for. I don't like that tactic either. And what I've been suggesting people do and what I've been writing in my letters is to get around that by saying, oh, you located 2000 records? Okay, those are what I want. I'm making a request for those 2000 records. Now they can't say that they need to winnow it down any, any further. They have to give you that set of records. They can't charge you anything more for it. Beware, there's a, there's a big caveat here that fees can go up in certain, uh, for certain types of records. Courts, for whatever reason, were given the ability to charge $1.25 per page uh, for copying, uh, even more for doing transcriptions of court reporter uh, notes. Registers of deeds get uh, some special charges, and also the Elections Commission gets uh, to set a larger charge for their voter lists. <laughs> copying costs. We're going to talk about two of these uh, sections or two of these types of charges. And the first one is copying pieces of paper. How much does copying paper actually cost? Well, the statute says that they get to charge you the quote, actual necessary and direct cost, end quote, of making those copies. Well, what does that actually mean? So we have some attorney general guidance from this. Uh, the attorney general has published a compliance guide uh, for quite a few years now. And originally the guide said, something to the effect of that number is probably about 15 cents a page and anything over 25 cents is suspect. Well, of course, what does every custodian do then? Every custodian treats that as permission to charge 25 cents. So you saw a lot of people at 25 cents per page. Now, Attorney General actually reviewed that a couple of years ago and revised it and removed that from its guide. So now they say this, they say you actually should be calculating what this really costs. What are your paper costs? How much are you paying for a ream of paper that you're using and divide that by 500, that's your paper cost. Copier costs, that's a little more complex. If you have a lease, you might be uh, paying a per copy cost on the lease. Uh, if you don't, what do you do? Well, uh, how much did your copier cost and what's the expected lifetime of the copier? How much does a, uh, a, a torn of cartridge or an ink refill cost and how many pages are you estimated to get out of that? They should be doing that and going through it. And when the attorney general did that for their office, they discovered that the cost of copying a black and white piece of paper was about one penny. So now that's what the DOJ is charging for their copies, uh, which is great. We have unfortunately not seen a lot of local custodians uh, following along with that guidance. That's something I've been looking to litigate in the past couple of years. <laughs> as a little fun aside on this one, kind of as a thought experiment, I'm always curious, what does FedEx Kinko's or other copy shops charge for their copies? And the answer I typically get is 11 cents, 12 cents a page maybe. And that raises a couple questions in my head. First of all, if they're making a profit at 12 cents a page, their actual cost must be less than that. It shouldn't be anywhere near 25 cents. Now, second, you might say, well, FedEx, Kinko's, they have other sources of revenue. Maybe it's a loss leader or they do it in bulk. So they, they, uh, their marginal cost for each copy is a lot less. That's true. But on the other hand, Instead of charging you 25 cents, couldn't the government custodian send the copy job to Kinko's and get it done for 12 cents a page? I think in a lot of circumstances they could. And if so, then why is it necessary? Remember that's in the statutory language. Why is it necessary for them to charge you 25 cents? It's not if they can get it done cheaply somewhere else. Uh, so that's something I push back on a lot, especially when we get larger uh, larger orders for large numbers of copies. Second big category of fees that we often see are location fees. This theoretically is just supposed to be what it takes them to find your records, not to review them or redact them as we talked about earlier. 
And again, you see this exact same language of actual necessary and direct cost for these fees. What does that mean? Courts have generally said that they get to charge an hourly rate with benefits, unfortunately, uh, for whoever's doing the work. Uh, so if somebody is making $50,000, that is about $25 an hour, but throwing in benefits after that, you might get up to $30, $40 an hour. So you very typically will see numbers between $30 and $60 an hour to, uh, for locating your records. Now there is a provision in the law that says that this number has to be greater than $50 before they get to charge it. Uh, but that was created in 1980. And with inflation, that number should probably be somewhere more like $150 right now. Uh, Governor Ebers budget proposal did include an increase of that up to $100, although I don't know what the status of that is with the Republican legislature. Um, but that's, that's the floor for a location cost. Uh, some people sometimes confuse that uh, with a waiver of the first $50. Uh, it is not a waiver. So if your bill is $60, it's not take 50 off of that and you owe 10. It's they can only charge it to you if it's over 50. Now, of course, that incentivizes your custodians to always take more than $50 worth of location if they can get away with it. Um, so it leads to a lot of abuse, I think, by custodians of this provision to either make a bunch of money off of it or at least, or also in some circumstances deter, deter uh, record requests by quoting very large location fees. Another trick kind of here is that they are supposed to be using the lowest paid employee who's capable of doing this work. So if you ever get a, a quote from a custodian saying, yeah, our superintendent of public schools needs to uh, review these records or locate these records rather. Uh, and you know she is making $160,000 a year. So we're talking about $100 an hour. Uh, ask them why a secretary can't do that. A, a part-time employee can't do that. Somebody lower paid can't do that. They should be making that decision. A couple other practice tips on, on fees for location here. In electronic air, in the electronic era, searching for electronic records is much, much faster. So whenever you can get away with it, and that pretty much depends on how the, uh, the entity you're interested in keeps their records, ask for them electronically so they can do the search. If you get a large fee quote, uh, maybe you should try narrowing your search first. Uh, decrease the size of your date range, uh, decrease the uh, the scope of the records, you know, do fewer categories of things you were looking for, fewer people to start with. Uh, some, sometimes if you request a small number of records to start, that'll give you some good ideas for further research as you go on. And as I said before, if they're trying to, trying to quote you time spent reviewing the records or deciding what's really responsive to your request, fight that, push back. Okay, they've got, rec they've got records, you've paid for the records or, or maybe you've, um, uh, they decided not to charge you anything. How long should you have to wait to get your records? The law is not clear on this. It does not create a strict deadline. It says as soon as practicable and without delay. That doesn't mean a whole lot, uh, unfortunately. Courts have never imposed a strict deadline. Uh, courts seem very loathe to hold government entities to any kind of rapid response, which I think is very unfortunate. Um, I've got a lot of theories about this. Um, if, if you're familiar at all with litigation, uh, you know if you make a dis discovery request for records, the other side has to turn them over in 30 days. I think that's a pretty good argument that if they had to, they could get your record request done in 30 days. Uh, no court has adopted it that yet, but I think it's a pretty good argument. Um, the Attorney General has some guidance on this as well. He says mm -hmm. if it's a simple request for an easily identifiable set of records, 10 business days. That's fine. Um, there's some requests, frankly, that should take a lot less than that. If you just shortly ask for, hey, I want the agenda from last night's meeting, you know, that should be able to be done in a matter of seconds, if not, uh, or at worst minutes. 
uh, shouldn't, that shouldn't take 10 days. Uh, but as a practical matter, there's a lot of variables that go into how long it will take you. Obviously, how big is your record request is a major one. Uh, how familiar with record requests is this government agency that you're making the request of? If you're dealing with smaller towns, smaller localities, uh, a lot of times they won't be familiar with this and won't know how to do it. Uh, might not be familiar with the, the type of records you're requesting. Whereas if you make a request of say a government agency that's very familiar with this, they know how to get it done quickly. They know what the, the, their resources are already dedicated to responding to record requests. That kind of goes along with the size of the agency. Uh, the bigger the agency is that you're requesting records of, the more likely they are to have people dedicated to doing this and people who are familiar with it. Um, and there is sometimes a need for review of records afterwards to see if any confidential information needs to be redacted and that can take time as well. Can we have a question in the chat from, from Steve Menzel regarding fees. Is it a general rule that the custodian should be able to document why the fee is what it is? Yes, absolutely. They should not just be quoting you a number and saying pay it. Uh, if they are taken into court, it is their burden to establish what these numbers are. And if they refuse to tell you how they break or they're breaking it down, uh, you should be considering threatening a lawsuit, getting an attorney and talking to somebody there. Because uh, if they can't back up how they're doing this, how they're calculating it, they, they could just be making it up. And you know, this is something that's hard to prove on a case by case basis. But I, frankly, I think a lot of times they are just picking numbers out of thin air without any real basis for them. I'm involved in litigation right now where a, a town just decided, yeah, we're gonna charge 50 cents a page. They have no records showing they did any calculations or anything. And they just said, well, that's our number. That's what we're doing. Gonna go through a last bit on the open records law of tips for making requests. Should your request be in writing or should it be in verbal? Should it be verbal? By law, you can do either one. Uh, by law, the, the agency has to respond no matter which way you make it. Uh, however, in most cases, I recommend doing it in writing for several reasons. One, you want to have a record of what was said when and by whom and exactly what your request was, exactly what any responses were. Another important reason for doing it in writing is to file a lawsuit, you have to have a written request. So legally, if you make a verbal request, they have to fulfill it, but you can't enforce it. So at, at that point, you're better off just making the request in writing. The only time I, I'm fine with a verbal request is if you're doing something really simple and spur of the moment. You know, my earlier example, if you're at a meeting and, and you, you go up to the clerk and say, do you have any extra copies of the agenda? That's a record request, but you, know, you might be able to get it done right then and there. What about identifying yourself or explaining what the purpose of your request is? The law says you don't have to do either one. You can stay anonymous. You can uh, refuse to explain why you want the records. And the law says that they cannot uh, deny your request because you refuse to identify yourself or because you refuse to state what the purpose is. So generally speaking, no, you don't have to. The question might be, is it ever a good idea to do so? And I think there are some circumstances you may want to do so. Um, for reporters out there in particular, I, th I think they're understanding that uh, identifying yourself as a, as a journalist is often going to get a, a better response. The, the custodian knows that uh, they're being watched and maybe reported on publicly if, if things don't go well. So that can often get a, a better or more responsive response from them. Um, a lot of times with record custodians, it's a very personal thing. Um, you build up relationships, especially if you're making requests repeatedly. Uh, so in some circumstances, making it known, yes, I'm just a local person and I'm interested in, the, in this topic uh, may help you along. You know, they don't, they can't refuse it. They can't refuse a record request because you want to stay anonymous, but 
Can they make it more difficult for you in all kinds of little obnoxious, annoying ways? Sure. And maybe identifying yourself is a way to help avoid that. Sometimes stating your purpose can be useful too. Um, in this circumstance I'm particularly thinking of where you're struggling to request the, the right records. Maybe you don't know exactly what records that the city you're talking to has, or you, you want a certain kind of information and you're not sure how it might be kept. You know, at this point, when you're talking to a custodian saying, you know, here's the question I have, here's the thing I'm trying to answer. I, I get that you don't have this one document I just asked you for, but can you, uh, ex explain to me what you do have that that might cover the same kind of information. If you're lucky, you get a custodian who honestly cares a little bit about transparency or at least doesn't want to be bothered with it forever. And if you're being persistent but polite uh, and making it clear you're not going to go away until you get your answer, a lot of times custodians realize it's in their best interest to kind of help you along and figure it out what it is you're looking for so they can get done with it. So in those kind of circumstances, it may be better to build a little bit more of a personal relationship with a custodian uh, and help them understand what it is you're trying to do if there's not a really good reason you wanna keep those secret. And I'll be completely honest, a lot of times there is. Uh, there is always that fear of going up against you know, town hall, city hall. Um, people do have real concerns about potential retaliation at times. So if you feel it's important, Go ahead and uh, keep yourself anonymous. <clears throat> Specificity in record requests is a very difficult topic to get right. A lot of times I see people make record requests that look like litigation discovery requests. And it's, I want every document uh, in any form whatsoever that has any relation to these 14 different topics over the last five years. And it just goes on and on and on. And it's very, very thorough. And then they get a response that says, okay, this is gonna take us 150 hours to research all of this because it's so broad and so comprehensive. Or they'll just get a denial that says, this is so broad that it's not reasonably specific. And there, there is a requirement uh, that requests not be so burdensome as to interfere with the normal uh, operation of the government office. So I typically recommend, recommend people to be as specific as you can, even if you're trying to research a much broader topic or going even on a fishing expedition, kind of figure out what's going on uh, if you start with a smaller set of documents, <coughs> excuse me, if you start with a smaller set of documents, you may find information that helps you craft more specific and more targeted record requests in the future. If you want electronic records, if you want paper records, doing electronic is often great for both uh, for reducing fees, both on the locating side because you can do electronic searches. And it's also great for reducing copying fees because you can get something emailed to you or uploaded to a file sharing service or even on a flash drive that you, you bring in. So usually there's little reason to request paper records unless you know that uh, who you're dealing with is a little behind the times and they tend to keep things only in paper. <clears throat> How do you make a request? What do you put in it in writing? You don't have to have magic language. There's no specific form that you have to use. Although for some of those earlier reasons, if they request that you use a form, you might wanna make things a little easier on yourself by using it unless you have a reason not to. But if you're writing one yourself, first off, you wanna make sure you're asking for records. Don't ask questions and don't ask for information. <clears throat> the law is clear and the courts have been very strict about this, that a request for information or asking the question is not a proper record request. So if you don't know what type of record it is you're seeking, you can cheat a little bit and make a request that's something like, I want records that contain this information. So say something like, I want records that show um, or records that demonstrate, different ways you can phrase it, 
the number of students who failed one or more classes this year versus last year. People have been making all kinds of requests about that to school districts, uh, kind of researching what the effect that school closings have had on student performance. And I see a lot of people get back responses that say, uh, well, we don't have a list of students that, uh, that failed, or we don't have a record, a single record that contains the number of students who failed. And they'll say, well, the law doesn't require us to make a new record. That's true. They're being obnoxious though. If you need to get around that by saying, I want records in your possession that show how many students failed. And if it needs to be pulled from different records, then I want all those records. And if they say, well, you know, we don't have to tabulate all this information for us, you can say, okay, then you give me the records that, and I'll do the tabulation. I'll do the calculations if you won't do them. If you're asking for electronic files, say you want them in, the, in their native format. With a court of appeals case from a few years ago uh, against, <coughs> excuse me, against a Republican legislator, the Court of Appeals ruled that a, an electronic request has to be fulfilled with electronic records if they exist. That does not mean that if they have a paper record that they have to scan it and give it to you, however. It only applies to a record that's already existing in a electronic format. I usually suggest people put in a cost threshold. You do not want to get a package in the mail one day with 75 pages of records and a bill for $400. Uh, so say something like if the cost will exceed $50, <coughs> please inform me first. Sometimes you send it to the wrong person. Sometimes it's not entirely clear who the correct custodian of these records are. So I usually include something in there that says, if you aren't the custodian of this information or these records, please forward it to the person who is. And finally, just say, please do contact me if you have any questions about it or if I can help clarify the request. Anything that kind of creates that back and forth personal relationship with the custodian to help you get it done can be helpful. <clears throat> so that covers what I want to on the open records law. That's the, the 101. And we'll move on to open meetings law. And again, if we have questions, feel free to shoot them into chat. We'll pass them along or we can save them for the end as well. <clears throat> Open the, oops, found my first typo on the slide. That should say open meetings law. The preamble to the open meetings law uh, starts out with uh, something that looks very, very similar to the open records law. Look what it says again, representative government, informed electorate, policy of the state, entitled to complete information. And then it even tells you in here, which is a little different than the open records law, what it's going to do. It's going to say that all meetings of all state and local governmental bodies shall be publicly held. So that's our basic principles that meetings of all state and local governmental bodies must be held in public. And just like we did for the open records law, we're gonna go through kind of those three key concepts. What's a body? What's a meeting? What's in public? So we're gonna start out with bodies. This is the question of, well, whose meetings are actually covered by the law here? Here you have the statutory definition. I'm not gonna read the whole thing because it goes on and on and on. But as you can see, just like the definition of records, the definition of governmental body is really comprehensive. Once again, we have the limitation to state and local agencies. So this does not affect federal uh, bodies of any kind. And then you have a list of what these bodies, these entities might look like. They might be boards, commissions, committees, councils, departments. Or, and here you go again, you get this public body, corporate and politic, created by the Constitution. Uh, created by the Constitution or a statute or an ordinance or other things. Notice that you have again here this idea of quasi-governmental corporations and a few other specific things that are listed there and a few things excluded. But the key here is to distinguish between the government entity and the body that runs it. 
So the city of Wasa is not a body. The city council of Wasa is the body. The mayor of, of, of Wasa is not a body. It's the city council, not your school district, your school board, not your county, your county board. When looking at a question of what is a body, there's a couple key factors that courts have looked at within that definition. First of all, it needs to be a collective entity. So it's a group of people acting in concert or acting as one. You know, if the individual members might disagree, uh, the whole body does act as a collective entity. You also need to have what the courts and uh, the attorney general have said is a numerically defined group of people. So there has to be a certain number of members of seats that stays the same. If it's a meeting that sometimes 10 people show up, sometimes 30, and it's just kind of open to whoever wants to show up, that's not a body under the law. And one of the reasons for that is that part of the tests later for whether the open meetings law applies, you have to do body counts and you have to count to a majority or a quorum or some other thresholds. And if you don't know what that denominator is, the total size of the group, you can't figure out if enough of them met uh, to constitute a meeting. So you have to have a set number of seats of members of this entity. Finally, it has to be created from the top and not organically by its members. So if you go back to the definition real quick, there is a part in there that says created by constitution statute ordinance, rule, or order. So those are all uh, governmental directives of kind of decreasing authority from the state constitution to statutes created by the legislature to ordinances created by uh, school, uh, sorry, by counties or municipalities to rules issued by agencies or orders issued by even individuals. The key thing there is it's created by something else other than itself. So if you have, <coughs> for example, if you have, say you've got a school district and all of the English teachers of the school district decide, hey, you know what? Every Friday we're gonna get together after school, we're gonna meet and we're gonna discuss our challenges and our students and the curriculum and what's going well and what's going poorly and what we could do better, et cetera. That's an organic creation. Uh, the, the attorney general's guide might call it an ad hoc body. It's not created by something else. It's created by its members organically. Now, if the superintendent said, you know what, we want to do some curriculum revision and we're going to have all the English teachers of the district meet and create a recommendation for the school board. Now you're doing looking at something that was created top down by a higher government authority and given a task to do, given a, a something to accomplish. So in that circumstance, it might be a, a body, whereas if it's just the teachers themselves deciding to meet once in a while, that would not be. So courts and the attorney general have gone through a lot of examples of, <coughs> excuse me, things that are bodies. You get some obvious ones like county boards, city councils. Uh, subcommittees of any of those foregoing things are included. So if your school board has a curriculum committee, that committee is a body itself, separate from the board entirely. We talked earlier about Lake Districts and yes, you might have a Lake District board that has uh, one member from each of the four municipalities that bound this lake and one member representing the county and one rep member representing a homeowners, uh, an HOA or other citizen group, that could be something that's a, a, still a governmental body that's covered. I talked about curriculum review committees. This was one of the cases uh, that I took to the Wisconsin Supreme Court and we were successful on in getting a ruling that when the administrators in the school district created a committee to review books for a curriculum uh, that that committee was covered by the law. 
the attorney general has also said that if you have, <coughs> excuse me, advisory groups that say the mayor says, well, I want, I'm gonna have uh, this group of 10 people meet every other month and discuss with me any concerns they have about the city, something like that can still be a body because it was created by an order from the mayor who is a governmental authority himself or herself and it's given a task to do. Some examples of things that are not bodies. Uh, important one is that single officials are not governmental bodies. So the mayor, uh, the, the mayor him or herself is not a governmental body subject to the law. If the mayor meets with the mayor's uh, just employees of the office, that's probably not a body. Uh, Joe, when you're just meeting with your subordinate employees. The statutes specifically say that courts, anything created by courts uh, is not a governmental body. Uh, so all the judicial councils of the Wisconsin Supreme Court creates uh, and courts themselves are not bodies, even though uh, the Wisconsin Supreme Court kind of looks like a governmental body. It has seven members, they act collectively. Uh, they're exempt from the open meetings law. Private entities uh, of boards, boards of private entities. So uh, public or private school districts would be one of the biggest ones, even though they're, they may be heavily funded by vouchers, uh, their boards are not considered governmental bodies. And also groups of employees. So as we were talking about with the example of the teachers who get together, if you've got uh, employee work groups who kind of create themselves and organize themselves and are just kind of loosely connected, those are not covered. So step two, step one is you've got a governmental body. Step two is, do you have a meeting? What is actually a meeting? How many people need to get together? What do they need to be doing in order to trigger the, the open meetings law? Here's your statutory definition, it kind of breaks down into three parts. The first part talks uh, is where the major language comes in. And it says, if the members convene, for the purpose of exercising their responsibilities, that's a meeting. Second paragraph says, well, we'll, we'll create a presumption. And that says anytime a majority or a little bit less than a majority of just half of them meet together, that'll be presumed to be uh, a meeting under the open meetings law. Once, once half of them have gathered, that doesn't mean it's automatically a meeting. If you have, uh, and this largely comes in in the third paragraph, that if you have half of them and they're getting together to go see a baseball game or to have dinner, uh, so long as business is not being discussed, which can be a tricky thing at times, uh, but as long as it is just social or chance get together, even if half of them are, or more are there, that won't be a meeting. So the courts have created a two-part test of here that comes kind of from this first paragraph or first sentence of language. And the part has two tests and the first part is the numbers test. You heard me talking about one half. Remember that one half uh, is a presumption and one half is not always the only way a meeting can occur. But your basic idea of a meeting is, do you have a quorum? That's typically going to be a simple majority of the members of the body. So if you have nine, that'll be five. There's also the concept of a negative quorum. And this one is, is, is kind of a fun relic of uh, supermajority requirements. So imagine you have a rule that says, can't pass a budget unless you have a two thirds majority. So if you have nine people that take six of them, <clears throat> excuse me, take six of them to pass a budget. That means that any four of them could block the budget, even though four is not a majority and is not a quorum, four of them are sufficient to control action on the budget. Therefore, if budget issues are involved, a negative quorum of four would qualify as a meeting. Finally, you have what are called walking quorums. And walking quorums prevent government entities from doing something cute like this. So imagine you have a five member city council and members A and B get together to talk about an ordinance and say, hey, we should pass a new law. And then members B and C get together and talk about the exact same thing and also agree that they should have this new law. Well, now all of a sudden, 
a majority of the city council has committed to taking a certain action. So you have, in effect, a majority and a quorum, even though it didn't occur in a single meeting. So the law prohibits these kind of walking quorums. So anytime you have groups of members less than uh, groups of uh, groups of the members meeting in numbers less than a quorum in a series of meetings, you might have a walking quorum. But there also is a purpose test. So just getting the numbers together isn't enough. They still have to be taking some kind of governmental action. So as the statute said, uh, it can't just be a chance gathering. You know, three of them happen to be at the supermarket at the same time. And it can't be just a purely social meeting. You're at the baseball game, you're out for dinner, whatever, and government issues aren't being discussed. But the courts have said that governmental business is pretty expansive and it's not just action. So it's not just taking a vote and deciding to do or not to do something. It also includes discussion. So if a majority gets together just to discuss that ordinance, even if they don't agree on what should be done about it, that's a meeting, that's subject to the law. Even beyond that, even information gathering, if done jointly together, can be a meeting. So if your, um, your majority of a city council, if three of five of them go out to a site together of a proposed development, they don't say anything, they don't do anything, they just all go out there and maybe listen to a presentation from the developer, that is still uh, a governmental purpose that can trigger the requirements of the open meetings law. Tom, we have two questions in the chat related to this. The first is, what about a meeting after the meeting? For example, a group of town supervisors discuss business in the town hall parking lot after the formal meeting. So if the group of supervisors is a quorum, that is a meeting. Uh, and if they had previously, uh, what's, well, I'm having a mental blank with the word for, uh, if, they, if they had adjourned, if they had previously adjourned and then go and have a further meeting afterwards, that's gonna be a violation. And the second question is piggybacking on the previous question. What if they go to one of the homes of the supervisors? Yep, same thing. That's going to be a meeting too. Uh, you cannot meet elsewhere. You cannot meet later without having properly noticed your meeting and held it in public. So, which is what we're going to get to next is the question of, <coughs> me, of uh, once you have a governmental body and once you have a meeting, well, what do they actually have to do? And there's two categories of requirements uh, for holding meetings in open session in public. One of them is public access, the other is notice. So for public access, all meetings must be held in a location that is reasonably accessible. There we ha have that language earlier that Kay was talking about, reasonably accessible to the public. It does not mean perfect accessibility, uh, it, it is what can be reasonably anticipated. So there have been cases that said, uh, if there is a sudden burst of interest uh, that was not expected in a topic and all of a sudden your, your room of, that holds 30 people and you typically never have more than five to 10 members of the public there, uh, just because 60 people show up this night uh, that does not mean your meaning is reasonably is not reasonably accessible. So like a, a sudden increase might not be an excuse to not stop it and, and go to a bigger, uh, bigger location. But courts do look at that reasonableness question and whether or not it can be anticipated. So if, if the city council or whoever it is should know that there's a reason for a dramatic increase in interest, they should prepare for that. If they don't, that could be a violation. Uh, of course, in COVID, we've all talked about this question of are electronic meetings, virtual meetings open to the public? And actually, even prior to the, uh, the to COVID, the attorney general had said that yes, teleconferences were acceptable in most circumstances as, as long as the public could phone in uh, and listen, and the information about that was made publicly available. Uh, so COVID didn't really create 
any new requirements or, or, or new access issues. Although our attorney general did come out and issue guidance saying, yes, Zoom meetings are acceptable so long as uh, people can uh, reasonably get into them uh, with kind of ordinary equipment. Uh, there's not, it's, it's again a question of reasonableness. Uh, perfect access is not necessarily, it only has to be reasonable. Another requirement of public access is public recording. It says right in the open meetings law statute that everybody has the right to record a public meeting so long as it is done in a way that does not interfere with the operation of the meeting. Uh, so a lot of times I've heard complaints from people who said I, I tried to set up recording equipment. They said I couldn't do it. Uh, that's a violation. They have to let you record. The second big requirement we talk about is, or that are in the statutes is the notice requirements. So typically these days, that means a copy of the agenda is posted uh, publicly beforehand. And notice requirements cover two different topics and that's what has to be in them and how do they get posted. So what has to go into a public notice is the topics or the subjects of the meeting. Uh, the statute is not terribly specific on the level of specificity that the agenda has to have, courts have said uh, that it has to be enough to let people, give people enough information to decide whether or not to attend. Uh, and th it's one of these multi-factor balancing tests that create a very gray area for courts. Uh, but some general rules are simply quoting a statute uh, is not enough. You often need to put in a little bit of a topic to go with that uh, statute. If you, uh, the courts have said that if you can give more information without making it burdensome, uh, either on the reader or the, uh, the person or people who are preparing the notice, you should give more detail. Uh, but for example, uh, things like just saying negotiating with union is probably not specific enough, but negotiating contract for next school year uh, would be better. Uh, there's a case that was that kind of drew, drew that line between two different things. Tom, I have a question. Is yeah, there a, a timeline? Um, I know a, a local town was not publishing the agenda of the meeting until the morning of the meeting. Is there any any? rule that says that they have to be sent out in a timely matter? Manner? Do, yes, uh, and that's a good thing to add. So I'm glad you brought that up. It is a 24 hour requirement uh, in most circumstances. The law does allow for an emergency shorter period, uh, but it has to be at, uh, at least two hours. So even in an emergency, they cannot change it uh, less, than, less than two hours before the meeting. So if they're doing it the morning of, that's not good enough. So once you have an agenda, uh, it needs to be posted publicly and the law creates a few requirements for that. So if you have an, an official newspaper, it must be sent to the official newspaper. Now notice this is important. It does not have to necessarily be published. So your, your city council does not necess necessarily have to pay for a publication of that meeting, but they have to give notice to their official newspaper. The second part is if any members of the news media have made written requests for notices, those have to be provided. And third, to the public. Notice has to be provided to the public. Prior to 2019, that was left ambiguous uh, uh, on exactly what that required. But the, it has been developed more recently uh, to provide three different ways that the government can uh, accomplish notice to the public. One is kind of your historic, typical, you post it in some public places, specifically here three. So, you know, on the library, outside the town hall, and on the bulletin board at the, corner, at the uh, center of Main Street. As an alternative, you can do just one physical posting if you also put it up on your website. Uh, so we've seen a lot of entities go to that sort of posting uh, since 2019. 
The third option is to actually pay for publication in a news medium, so typically a newspaper, that's likely to give notice. That's often going to be your official newspaper or otherwise just the largest uh, lo local newspaper in circulation. Uh, so notice that there's a difference. So we, you go back a step and you have three groups. You have the newspaper gets notice, medium gets notice if they made requests, and the public gets notice. Then for the public, there's three ways to do it. So if you're paying attention, you notice that under 3.3 here, under the third way of doing the third requirement, if you pay for publication in your official newspaper, that covers both uh, uh, notice to the public and notice to the official newspaper. So if your city is paying for publication that way, that covers two of their three bases. Last major thing to talk about with uh, open meetings law is when do they get to go into closed session? There are specific circumstances in which they may do so, and they are laid out very specifically in the statute. Uh, so first to talk about that procedure, they have to do it a very specific way. Number one, they have to give notice that they're going, going to go into closed session. That means in that 24 hour agenda that's posted the agenda that's posted 24 hours ahead of time, they have to say we're going to go into closed session. They cannot at the meeting decide, okay, maybe we need to have a closed session. If they want to do that, they need to schedule another meeting uh, 24 hours in advance or in the future. Or if there's a very emergency reason that they need to uh, go into closed session, they have to put out a notice at least two hours ahead of time. All meetings must begin in open session. So even if the only thing they're doing is going straight into one of these closed executive sessions, they must convene in open session first. And then they must publicly during the meeting announce the purpose of their closed session again, which is typically going to be uh, by reading what the notice was written on the agenda. And they have to vote to do it. Uh, if they don't vote to do it, that's an improper closed session. Now, the statute lays out specific categories of circumstances where they can go into closed session. One doesn't occur at the local level very much, but uh, it, for uh, several state bodies, they have to decide cases. They almost act like uh, little mini courts, administrative courts, uh, where they decide cases. And if they're deliberating those cases, they get to go into closed session. Individual personnel matters. I emphasize individual because I have seen time and time again, local, local boards think they, they can go into closed session to discuss across the board uh, payroll decisions, across the board raises, across the board pay cuts, uh, new handbook issues. These categories of closed sessions are only for individuals. And they're broken off into two, thing, two uh, subsets of personnel matters. One is punitive. So if they are disciplining, dismissing, uh, licensing individuals, uh, they can make those decision, decisions in closed session. Uh, but there's some that are either positive or more neutral. And for if they're making hiring decisions, so for example, the uh, local school board wants to deliberate uh, hiring a superintendent, they may do so in closed session. Same thing for promotion, compensation, kind of if they're dealing with uh, employees or appointed officials on a, a one at a time basis, they can go into closed session to do that. Similar to that, if the governmental body is going to be discussing sensitive information about individuals, uh, which is sometimes employees, but sometimes it's other members of the public, uh, that can be done in closed session. So for example, for medical information, financial or other private information. Tom, Norm has a question. Must minutes be kept on what occurs in a closed session? Ah, bigger question than that. Must minutes be kept at all? Uh, and the answer is no, actually, that the law does not require anything more than just this limited bit, which is keeping a, a record of roll call votes. So if they get an individual vote from each person, they must have a record of that. Uh, and the same rule applies for closed sessions as well as open sessions. 
Uh, and that actually raises some interesting questions about can you get the minutes if they do take them of closed sessions? And the answer uh, under the open records law, and the answer is sometimes yes, because the initial reasons for closing a session sometimes aren't eternal. If there's a competitive or bargaining issue going on, uh, usually at some point in time, it becomes a moot question of, of what that competitive or bargaining interest was. And after the passage of time, sometimes you, you, uh, the need to keep that secret disappears and you should be able to get those. And that, that, that touches right on where we are right now, which is uh, that when the governmental body is uh, engaging in competitive and bargaining activities, if it's required to protect those interests, they can go into closed session. Now, this one is abused all the time. Uh, I see lots and lots of closed sessions where they're simply discussing things that happen to be tangentially related to contracts or bargaining. Uh, but it's really supposed to be, is uh, the question it's supposed to be, is secrecy absolutely necessary here? Not just, is it convenient? Might it be a little bit better? It's supposed to be required, and courts have been pretty strict on this too, which has been a pleasant surprise. Uh, but unfortunately, bodies have not always kept up with what courts actually re actually require. So I do see this misused quite a bit. And the final major category of closed sessions are for conferring with attorneys, uh, and this interestingly specifically has to do with litigation or potential litigation. Uh, oftentimes, government attorneys will be uh, at a governmental body's meeting and will be asked for advice. And if the advice is not about litigation or about uh, a lawsuit that they might get into, it's not supposed to be done in private. So there's actually a fair amount of uh, advice from governmental attorneys at, at meetings that should be done in public. And again, this is one that is sometimes abused and it's gonna be difficult to challenge because if you don't know exactly what's being said in the closed session, you don't have much of a basis for challenging it. And that actually wraps that up. We've talked about everything to cover a very basic start for the, the 101 of open government in Wisconsin. You know, we've, we've talked about open records laws and open meetings laws. Uh, Fortunately, you haven't talked about uh, other states much or uh, what, what goes on at the federal government level, uh, but I'm happy to take any other questions we might have. Uh, Sarah Olson, you need to let people be unmuted. I know Stephen Schreier had a request to be unmuted. Otherwise, I do see a couple questions in the chat. I'm happy to take a quick look at. I think, uh, I think Steve can do it. Um, I have to request him to do it. I have no need to be unmuted. Thank you. Oh, OK. <laughs> so I did see a question in the chat about uh, approval of minutes. Um, that's a little bit of a, of a red herring of a question. Uh, the officialness of them doesn't matter much for records or meetings purposes. Uh, it, that's more of a kind of Robert's rules of orders or uh, just a, a, an internal procedural question about uh, what the governmental body is supposed to be doing. And also I saw uh, bids for municipal services. Should bids for municipal services be discussed in closed session? I'm so glad you used the word should there because uh, a lot of people might phrase the question, must they be discussed? And uh, courts and the attorney general have emphasized that closed sessions are not required in any of these circumstances. These are circumstances where closed sessions are permitted, uh, but there's nothing in the law saying that they cannot discuss these things in open session. Uh, so that's a good thing to remind uh, your elected representatives uh, that uh, they do not have to do these things in closed session and it, it may be in their benefit to hold them openly. And on the more specific question of bids for municipal services, um, it depends on what part of the, of the negotiating you're talking about. Um, 
So you say, say you've, you're putting out bids for I don't know, a trash pickup and you get three bids come in and you're trying to decide which one of them to do. I don't mm. see a reason to keep that secret uh, because it's not going to affect any further bids. You're not taking any more bids. Um, if you are considering a counter offer of some kind and deciding on a negotiating strategy, uh, that could justify a closed session. But if, if, if you've received the bids and you're discussing which of them to accept based on their merits, uh, that should be done openly. Uh, there's a question from Robert Cronwell, which I don't understand. Robert, can you clarify what you're asking? I think I get it here. There, there, there's several different ways to enforce both the open records law and the open meetings law. Um, the attorney generals and the, well, the, the one attorney general of the state and the district attorneys of each county are empowered to enforce them. Uh, they very rarely do. Uh, I, I don't think we've had an attorney general bring an enforcement action uh, since Lautenschlager, I believe, and I think she only had one. Um, it's very, very rare uh, at the state level. District attorneys, I personally have never seen a records enforcement from a district attorney. I have seen the occasional meetings law enforcement uh, action from district attorneys. Uh, but very typically, if you make a request like that, you get a response saying, uh, that does look like it's a problem, but uh, we're busy with murderers and thieves and arson and uh, we don't have the resources to do that. And hey, you can file your own lawsuit. And that whole problem is largely why I created the Wisconsin Transparency Project is, is we have really good laws about this stuff. They're just not getting enforced very much. And when they're not enforced very much, custodians and officials learn that they can get away with a lot. Tom, I have a question about what's happening in the le Wisconsin legislature right now. If I understand correctly, some assembly person or senator is trying to push a bill to restrict open meeting records and laws. Do you know anything about that? I haven't read anything about a, a recent push on that. No, okay. sorry. I think I, I heard that they were trying to um, dial back all the notices that are required and with website uh, you know, with electronics, the internet now that they're, the legislation is trying to roll back some of those print media requirements. But this is a, an interesting area because uh, villages and towns are not required to have an official newspaper. Cities are, uh, but, but the smaller municipalities are not. Um, so one way around that is to simply stop having an official one. Um, but this does bleed into other areas because there are, are a lot of things that have, have to be done in an official newspaper that aren't the open meetings law notices. Uh, there are sp more specific notices. Uh, TIF districts, for example, have to be noticed. Um, uh, your annual budget has to be noticed. You know, and there's talk like class one, two, three notices. Those are all a little bit different than the open meetings law notice requirements. Which is a long winded way of saying, hey, that sounds interesting. I should look in more closely at what they're talking about doing. Um, I have a question. Um, you did a very thorough presentation, um, which is really appreciated. Uh, several references made to if you're being overcharged or if you have to, you know, push harder, it sounds like you pretty much as a private individual or private group have to spend your own money to compel legally a non-complying public agency to provide what the law requires. Yes, and they get to spend your money fighting you. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's part of the problem. I've, there are resources out there. Um, it, it, I don't want to turn this into a big commercial for myself, but I do, my consultations are at no charge kind of initial and I offer a lot of uh, free quick advice. Uh, you know, here's a few things you could say back to people. 
uh, back to the custodians who are giving you trouble. Uh, the Wisconsin Freedom of Information Council is a fantastic organization. Uh, Bill Leaders has been the president there for many years now, and he takes calls all the time and is happy to uh, offer advice to people uh, pushing back to. Uh, you can go to the attorney general and uh, a few years back uh, under Schimmel and Walker, they created the Office of Open Government, which is a great improvement. Uh, so they're now um, a, a small office in the DOJ that is dedicated to uh, open records and open meetings. They don't do enforcement, but they will uh, uh, take your question or your complaint and try to answer it or, or work with the custodian to try to resolve it. It's, but it is a very slow process. Um, the current wait time is something close to nine months uh, to get a letter back on those, which is it's something we're, we're looking at trying to fix and figuring out what to do about that. I think part of the problem is this, this office is also in charge of responding for the Department of Justice to their record requests. And uh, pretty much like every state agency, especially during COVID, they've had an, an enormous increase in requests. So this Office of Open Government is now much busier uh, working on behalf of DOJ, and it seems to have less time for dealing with uh, citizen questions and complaints. I'm keeping my eye on the time here. Um, any other really pressing questions? Tom, anyone, any, you know, last statements that you want to make? The three Ps, be persistent, be polite, be practical. Let them know you're not going away. Don't make enemies out of them because they can make life miserable for you in a million ways. Uh, and you know, be willing to work with them on, on, on your request and maybe making it easier on both them and yourself if you can. Okay, thank you. Um, in keeping with Sunshine Week, the League of Women Voters Northwoods has had an observer corps for quite a while. Um, and we are always interested in more people being part of that observer corps. So if you um, are interested in or already do attend a school board meeting on a regular basis, a town supervisors meeting, a counter board meeting, a school board meeting, whatever, um, and you're interested in being part of our observer corps, um, and you don't necessarily have to be a league member to do that. Um, please send an email to information at LWVNOW with your contact information. Um, and our final thing is our next public meeting is Tuesday, April 13th. Jane Banning will be leading a discussion and a presentation on civil discourse. So, um, and I believe that meeting is at two o'clock. I cannot remember, but you will be getting pressed for four o'clock. Thank you, Sarah, four o'clock. Um, and um, this is always a topic on our minds, especially when we attend open meetings. So um, thank you very much everyone for joining us. And um, just a reminder, we got a lot of really good information on our website these days. So um, go check it out, LWVNOW. Dot org. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. My pleasure. Thanks for all having me on. Great. Mm -hmm.